So pretty much every day on stream for the last several weeks, I'm getting multiple people per day asking me something along the lines of, I'm new to chess, got any tips for me? You know, where should I start? What should I do? So today I am going to give uh, you my comprehensive advice for anybody who is new to chess to get into it and get started and um, yeah, join the chess community. And I'm going to have almost everything, almost all my advice written here on slides uh, so that you can follow along if you're not great at hearing stuff. And for me, I'm not great at remembering stuff, so it helps for me to have it written down as well. So welcome to how to become a chess player for noobs. I'm gonna assume that basically you are a noob if you're watching this video. And um, what that means is that, you know, your US Chess Federation equivalent rating would be under 1200 probably. Um, maybe you've only been playing for a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, um, but you're probably playing online. So your online rating, if it's on chess.com, a rapid rating under 1200 probably. On Lee Chess, maybe a few hundred points higher than that, maybe 1500. <laughs> I think the Lee Chess ratings are higher. If it's Blitz, it's also a couple hundred points higher. So you might be 13, 14, 1500 in Blitz, but, but still be pretty new in some ways. It depends. Blitz really marks different skills. But anyway, if you think that you're a new player and you want to know what to, where to get started, then this is the video for you. And um, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of material out there right now. And it's easier to get confused as to what to use than it is to find something, right? So uh, there's no trouble finding somewhere to play or something to watch or read but it's hard to know what exactly you should focus on and almost everybody is doing it completely wrong. So here's my take. Um, if you're new to chess, I'm gonna start by introducing myself. You probably don't know who I am or what any of this means, but um, I am an international master. I have 27 years of teaching experience across a variety of different fields. Um, only 25 years of experience teaching chess, but I've taught swimming, French, math, English, English as a second language, French as a second language, in German, um, you know, a whole, whole variety of uh, different things over the years. Um, and I'm pretty happy with the outcomes of my students. In general, I give them a positive relationship to themselves and to their field of study. So for example, so while I may have some students who eventually become very good at chess, what's more important to me is that I have a lot of students who eventually have a healthy relationship to chess. They have a lifelong love of the game. They may not play for a few years because there's other things in life that are really important too, you know, college or a kid or who knows what, right? Some other field of study. There's a million interesting things in the world and uh, worthwhile pursuits, but they still in their heart have a spot for chess. They may come back to it at some point. They may use some of the things they learned from chess in some other field. Um, you know, I. I'm happy not to have students who are like crashing and burning and tilting and quitting and, you know, feeling horrible, not wanting to see a chess game, wanting to win, but not wanting to play, hopefully avoiding most of that stuff. And then the other thing about my teaching is I try and give my students as much as possible tools with which they can continually improve on their own and keep learning and also tools that you can apply to fields other than chess as well. So that's, um, that's who I am. And uh, I'm also one of the members um, currently of a three-person team with International Master Kostya Kavutsky and Grandmaster Jesse Cry running this chess dojo channel on both YouTube and Twitch. And, uh, you know, we're providing uh, a community on Discord and streams and videos and stuff like that for people. All right. The first thing you should do if you're new to chess is you should play. Actually about 85 to 90% of your time, I would estimate should just be playing chess games. A lot of people are trying to do a lot of things. We'll talk about some of those other things later on, but actually the basic thing is that you just need to play. I believe that just by playing games, you will get, um, you, you know, you sort of subconsciously process what happens in your games and you get better and better at chess and you learn more and more just by playing games. Um, that said, you'll get the best feedback from your games if you're playing people within a couple hundred rating points of you. It's not super useful to play somebody a thousand points lower or a thousand points higher other than as like, you know, an inspiration when you're playing somebody higher and a favor when you're playing somebody lower. But actually you learn less 
in some ways from playing somebody really good because no matter what you do, you lose, so you don't really see which of your moves are better or worse. Um, there is an exception to that. You can play against strong players if they give you odds. If they remove enough pieces so that your score is somewhere between 25 and 75%, then it's actually great to play against strong players because you'll get to see really good moves from them, but you'll also see a difference between your better and your worst games. right? But when the skill level is too great in a chess game, if someone's too much better than someone else, then when that person plays really well, they still lose when they play really badly. They still lose, and they can't really calibrate and tell the difference from that. But yeah, you want to spend gobs and gobs of times playing, and as you get better at chess, you'll have to spend more time, if you want to improve, you have to spend more time studying, and there's all kinds of ways to do that, and less time playing, and more time studying in between your games to actually improve your craft. But at first, you're kind of bad at everything, and you need to just log a ton of practice. Um, Another cool thing that you can do when you're playing is you can talk to your opponents after the games. Uh, this can be, you know, just exchanging two sentences with them. Um, it doesn't have to. It, it doesn't have to be, and it probably won't generally be, in, and shouldn't be at this point, um, some like long, you know, one-hour discussion of the ins and outs. Though, if you get into one of those at some point, like go for it. It's one of the cool things about chess. But one of my favorite things about chess is a tradition called the postmortem, where after a game is over in a chess tournament, the two players will leave the playing hall to then talk together about the game they've just played. They leave the tournament hall to not distract the other players. You know, that's important etiquette as well to know. Um, but when your game is done and you can just talk to your opponent, it's a really great chance to exchange, you know, a couple ideas. Um, now, also while you're playing, don't play the same opening endlessly, just on and on and on. I see a lot of people stuck in a rut, either of Italian game or Four Knights game, which is E4, E5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, or e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3. You don't know all that notation yet, but basically it's king pawns and then bringing out the knights and then um, you know deferred action. But whatever the opening that somebody is like stuck in, if you play the same opening on and on, you're limiting your own learning process and your own knowledge because you're only learning one sort of example of chess. And in that one opening that you're playing, it may be very, very valuable to win a pawn, or it might be very, very valuable to get ahead in development, or it might be very, very valuable to give somebody doubled pawns or something like that. And that might not apply to other positions, other structures, and other openings. So you'll be learning stuff and thinking like, this is all that chess is about, and then you'll get into other positions one day in your life and you'll be completely disoriented. So it's a really bad idea to get stuck in a rut. You also start to get bored, lose inspiration, run out of ideas. Um, I've seen a lot of people doing it. It's very, very common and it's lame. So on the other hand, I don't recommend switching openings every game because then you'll never get like deeply enough into any opening to actually learn something in it. So I think it's it, it's very jarring and disorienting, especially as a new player to play something completely new every single game, no idea, no plan, where are you trying to put your pieces or anything like that. So I would say if you play one opening, say for white and some other opening for black, right? Um, it's, it's sort of independent, your white games and your black games in a sense. But if you play a particular opening for somewhere from 30 to 60 games, that's probably good for learning something about that opening and then moving on and starting to practice something else. And just like I think it's good to practice different openings, you want to try different time controls. A lot of people ask me, what time control should I play? Like, should I be playing two hours while I learn more? But I don't know what to think about, you know, during those two hours. Or other people, you know, should I be playing like blitz games so I play more total games or whatever? Well, there's... There's arguments for all these things, but I think there's not actually one answer. I think you should try different time controls and find what fits you. You kind of want to be spending whatever amount of time you're comfortable with spending on a game, right? So if, if it turns out that you like to spend about 23 minutes thinking about your games, then you know 23 or 25 minutes per game would be a good time control for you. Then you have to find some other people who want to play that time control. But you know, by trying out, you know, blitz and rapid and classical, which is another word for slow chess, which is, you know, two or three hours per player per game. Uh, by trying out those different things, you'll get to see um, what works for you and what you think about. It. And also be aware that as you develop, that's going to change. So there will be, you know, as you get better, you might be able to play faster games. Or as you get better, you might have more things to think about and want to play a slower game. It, it can go different ways for different people. So Keep revisiting that. Keep trying out a few different time controls now and then and seeing what's optimal for you right now so that you're enjoying the game and then also getting to think an appropriate amount of time uh, to be making progress from playing. 
Next up, the main thing that you're going to study at first other than playing, really the only studying I suggest you do at first, is tactics. And that's because chess is based largely on pattern recognition. When a, when a chess player, like an experienced chess player, sees a position and finds some sort of, some sort of way to deflect one piece and then um, you know, overwork another piece and then line two pieces up on a diagonal and win one of them, when they do that, it's not because they just looked at five million possibilities and, and found that that one was the best. Um, and it's not because they had some really complicated system for finding likely candidate moves and then blah, blah, blah. Most likely it's because some piece of the tactic just popped into their minds as soon as they found themselves in that position. And that's because there's this huge component of pattern recognition in chess. So if you want to become a strong chess player, ultimately you're gonna need like, two, three thousand of these kind of puzzles at least. Uh, uh, sorry, not of these puzzles, of these patterns sort of lodged in your mind to pop up for you when similar situations arise. Um, to know more about it, sorry to plug myself, but you're gonna have to go watch my How to Learn Tactics video. That's my best uh, advice to you in that video. And that's how you're gonna go about studying tactics. So that's the one video that I'm gonna have you guys watch only thing i'm suggesting after watching this video until you get to 1200 is that one video watch it then find a source of simple tactics that you can do um, using the method um, from that video try not to miss any days if you can 10 to 15 minutes is all it takes it's not that much some of you may have like smartphones with which you can use some sort of website or app to do your puzzles you know, while you're in the bathroom or something like that. And that can basically get you almost every day. And then, yeah, follow the advice from that video. And I'm gonna take a quick pause here and mention a disclaimer I forgot to mention at the beginning when I was introducing myself. An international master, there's lots of grandmasters in the world that are much better than me, you know, at playing a couple thousand uh, players, probably. I'm not necessarily the best chess teacher in the world, as well as not being the best chess player in the world. but what I'm giving you is the best advice that I can, my best, my best ideas, and different people are gonna have different advice on these things, different reasonable people who are good teachers and have good experience. So this is one approach, but you know, at this point, I think it's the best approach, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm giving to you. Feel free to you know, argue about it in the comments section or find some other good player, find you know, any other sensei or teacher to talk to about it. They'll give you some slight differences. Um, that's fine, but you should pick something that you pretty much trust and then go with it. Don't muddle around. Like, don't be like, yeah, I'm following David's method, but then do all of my don'ts at the end of this as well, right? Like, uh, you know, if you're going to have somebody sort of be your teacher, whether it be through a video or through private lessons, like you have to trust and believe in that person and then go with what they um, tell you to do, even though you know that it's not necessarily 100% right. All right. My next recommendation to you is after you've been playing on your own for a little bit, get one private chess lesson. A private chess lesson, if you hire somebody you know, who lives somewhere expensive, um, is probably gonna run you like $100, maybe even $200. Um, I know some really great teachers who, I know at least one really great teacher who charges more than that. So, um, so one private lesson can be quite expensive. But I also think it can be invaluable because, I mean, first of all, it has to come from a really good teacher. Um, so somebody who's you know pretty strong at chess, like a, you know at least a, a master of some kind, and somebody who's also strong as being a teacher. It's not really useful to have somebody if we're just going to do this one lesson that's going to be so important for you. It's not really useful to have somebody who's just a good teacher but doesn't know chess, or somebody who's really good at chess and doesn't know teaching. And what you should be looking for here is you should be looking for that person to give you a profile. And this is why you have to play a couple months before you do this lesson, right? If you do a private lesson right now when you're a clean slate, tabula rasa, like what, are, what, what specific advice or help are you gonna get? The most they could give you is some advice like what I'm giving you in this video here on YouTube, which is free to you, yay, right? Because you don't yet have strengths and weaknesses and proclivities and the, the teacher doesn't yet know anything about your own ways of learning how you absorb material, how you memorize. They don't know anything about you with which to give you something more specific. So you definitely need to have already been playing for a couple months and you're looking for this teacher to give you a profile on yourself. What are your strengths and weaknesses? How do you 
think about the game. What are the areas that you should be trying to improve at next, right? Your proximate developmental stages within chess. Um, maybe how are you as a learner? You can give them some of that, like I am visual or I need to like actually do something with my own hands or blah. You know, you can tell them some of that and they can tailor some suggestions on how you can continue to work on chess to that information that you've just given them about yourself. And you have to be clear to the teacher that that's what you're looking for. You're not looking for like weekly lessons. You're not looking for, you know, one new opening novelty in the King's Indian defense. You're looking for them to really give you in, in one lesson some, some way to figure out how to improve yourself and like work on your chess probably for the next couple months on your own again. Um, and that does mean that that teacher is also going to have to like play through some of the games you've been playing before they do the lesson with you so they know so they can read you and know where you're at, you know, and, and a good teacher probably with just a couple of your games can get a good idea. But me personally, I look through, you know, dozens of a student's games before a first lesson to give them a good profile. Anyway, I think it'll be very, very much worth it. If you think about it, you know, some people buy like, you know, 10 books and 10 online courses and videos and memberships and blah, blah, blah. And even though one private lesson on its own is more expensive than all that stuff, if it's really good and really directed and really sets you on a good path, um, it can be more useful than a bunch of things you bought that actually you get no value out of. So I, I would recommend that at this point. Um, finally, very important thing, this is semi off the chessboard, but very, very important for your improvement is you're not going to become great at chess totally on your own, probably. I mean, some people have occasionally, um, and some people have enjoyed chess on their own. I mean, because this what to do is not just about improving. It's also about how to enjoy chess, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not just trying to tell you what to do to get better, but this should also be, to some extent, maximizing your enjoyment of chess. And for most of us, um, you know, making some kind of like acquaintances within the chess world is both conducive to enjoying chess and to improving. So you're gonna to wanna to find probably a community and there's a bunch of different places you can find those. Like you can find a Discord server where people are talking about chess. You can find um, clubs on like chess.com or on Lee Chess where there's like a group of people like, you know, sometimes it's grouped by like Boston chess players. Sometimes it's grouped by like um, King's Gambit players. You know, they've got like a group. Sometimes it's like Magnus Carlsen fan club some random point of interest or you know common experience can be the basis of one of these clubs or groups or teams um, a twitch channel um, sometimes will have basically its own community right people who see each other again and again day in day out on the same twitch channel and talk together there have conversations while while the show's going or not um Maybe maybe some other like online forums. There's like a, a Reddit for chess, that kind of thing. Find find you know some place where you can talk, where you can post questions and, and chat with people, some forums or something. Um, and then make chess friends, okay? And there's a lot of different people who can become your chess friends. I mean, it could be somebody you play one game against and then afterwards when you're like, hey, nicely played, and they're like, wow, my opponents normally insult me after I win a game. Um, that's really cool of you to... Uh, to be polite about it and you say, well, of course, I mean, I thought that thing you did with the knight was really cool. I'd never seen that before, you know, and you know, why, why would I, why would I flame you for that? You know, I, I was happy to learn that new knight thing. And then for whatever reason, you guys just hit it off. And, you know, there's no accounting for exactly when this will happen, but I've made tons and tons of friends through chess and often it's just, you know, just a random comment after a game that uh, shows two people their, their common humanity and their common um, you know, love of and pursuit of chess, and then they can become fast friends for life. Um, it could also be some, you know, helpful person who answers some questions for you in an online forum, an experienced player. There's a lot of people just giving out tips and helping hands to uh, noobs. And then uh, it could also be like a peer, somebody who's about your strength and interest level, who's working on their chess. And uh, this has been the greatest source of improvement for me in my life and I guess also enjoyment along with it. But, um, you know, some, some close friendships where for several years in a row, we would, every time we would play a game, we would show it to the other person and discuss it together and tell them what openings we were planning to play at our next events and discuss all that kind of stuff. That can be um, super useful. So I strongly encourage you guys to make chess friends. Um, 
many, many, many of the experienced chess players that I know will tell you that the best thing that chess has brought to their life were their chess friends, actually. Above, you know, a career, above the joy of playing a game they love, above artistic satisfaction, sporting satisfaction, anything. Um, for a lot of people, it's just their chess friends. Now, here are some optional things. Um, the first couple are actually recommendations, and then the last couple are just like, well, you can do it if you want to. I'm not going to tell you not to, but it's not necessarily like good for you. So first of all, whatever inspires you, I want to say that, you know, because like I may tell you like, don't do this or don't do that. But if doing that thing inspires you to play chess, if it brings you enjoyment, if it makes you, you know, relish your experience as a chess player and want to play more chess, then fine, like go with it, right? So um, a good example of that would be if we hop down to the second to last item here, reading a chess book. If you are rated like 600 and you read Mikhail Tal's My Life and Games, he's a world champion, famous for his wild attacking style, sacrifices, brash personality. If you read his autobiography and like read over his games, like, are you going to learn something about chess? Some of the early books that I read when I was just starting out, I don't really remember any of the X's and O's of them, you know, because I was too weak. Like, you know, if you're 600, you're not going to understand a Mikhail Tall game. That's just, that's just how it is. You're not really going to understand it. Maybe some little something is being rubbed off on your subconscious where you're processing all this chess stuff and gradually gaining strength. Who knows? But but realistically, you know, you try and study most chess books, you're not actually going to learn anything at the X's and O's level. But if you enjoy reading that book, if it makes you want to go play, you know, some opening that Mikhail Tal played next week at your chess club, then it's good for you to be reading that book, even if it's not actually something that I would recommend to you as like, you know what you really need to study are Mikhail Tal's games because you don't understand that, you know, your materialism is weighing you down and that there are all kinds of situations where you can be down material and have an advantage and you need to be experienced in these positions. No, that's the kind of advice I might give to a 16, 1800, um, you know, experienced club player who has a particular weakness there. But whatever inspires you, is always going to be good, whether it's a bad opening or a great chess player or end game studies or chess riddles. You know, Sherlock Holmes walks into a room, a chess board set up weirdly. There's one piece that's been knocked off. Where on the board must that piece be? Whoa, for some people, that's awesome. So whatever that is for you, go with it. Um, next advice is playing in tournaments. This is optional. Again, you don't have to do it, but I strongly encourage it. Um, playing chess behind a mouse and a keyboard, click, 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 is a very different experience from being in a flesh and blood chess club or a chess tournament. Obviously, you know, I'm not telling you to risk a pandemic to go play a tournament if you're watching this video like right now, the day I recorded or the next day. But if you're watching this a year down the road, hopefully you can go to tournaments whenever it's like safe to do so. Going to chess clubs and going to tournaments, um, and maybe you're so lucky as to live somewhere where that's safe right now, but. Um, it's, it's an incomparable experience, feeling the pieces, seeing the other people's faces, talking to people between games, seeing like the nerves, seeing how different people psych themselves up, seeing what people are studying on the side, what they're eating, what their snacks are, um, hearing Jesse cry, sigh from stress. Um, the, it, there's no replacement for that stuff. I mean, that's, you want to have that coursing through your veins. You want to go out and get that experience. So I recommend that you go play a tournament as soon as possible. And if you're online, um, you know, just playing an online tournament is already like a pretty cool experience, though it won't replace that. It is a different experience than playing a single game. And I do recommend it. And uh, if your rating is 300, if your rating is 800, if your rating is 1500, if your rating is 2000, I recommend you play a tournament. And another thing that's optional, but that I recommend is drilling some basic end games. Um, for example, on chess.com, there's a product called chess.com slash drills, I think, um, where basically it, it has certain positions that are pre-programmed and it'll be like king and two rooks against king and you practice checkmating with that or king and queen against king and you practice chess checkmating with that. Um, practicing all those like basic checkmates with just like a few pieces, very good. Practicing some end games like king and two pawns against king and you're trying to get one of the pawns down the board to get a queen. Playing some of those things again and again and again so that you've really got them down is super, super valuable. It takes, te teaches you very basics about how to use the pieces. And even if you're a noob, 
those are at your next level. I know that those are proximate level for you. You can do them. You can even learn the bishop and knight checkmate, which a lot of like 1500s are afraid of because they've never learned it. But you can be absolutely new. This could be your second day playing chess and you could go learn the bishop and knight checkmate today. Um, just drilling it, practicing it again and again, reading the uh, reading a tip or asking another player for one or two tips about it and then just practicing it. You can You can learn it in a day or two and it'll fundamentally teach you how to use the bishop and the knight as pieces. So I do recommend doing that very much. So, um, you know, some basic end games like that will be a useful thing. So you could spend a little bit of time on that and it wouldn't derail the 85 to 90% play plus daily tactics um, master plan, which I have given you. Now some things that will basically be approximately neutral for your chest, neither beneficial nor detrimental. Um, it depends on the player. For some players, these things will help and for some they might hurt slightly, but in general, these things are, are on average fairly neutral. You can watch videos, you can watch streams, you can study online courses. Sure, if you want to do that stuff, do it. I mean, just know that if you're new, you're probably wasting your time and money, right? But if but if it hits that first one and if it inspires you, sure, go for it. You know, it's not gonna, it's not likely to be bad for you. Very unlikely. I mean, you could be watching videos by players rated also 600 who are pretending to be chess teachers, and that could be bad for you, but. You know, if you're watching material prepared by masters, it should generally be fine. It shouldn't ruin you, even if they haven't put much effort into it and it's not particularly good work. And maybe some of it will be good work and will and will touch you in some ways. Um, same for chess books. Um, I would look for chess books by, you know, some really good authors. We've got some recommendations from Kostia, which I will try to put the link all over the place for people because I haven't done a list of chess books yet. Um, it's, it's fine to read some chess books, but a lot of chess players buy, you know, 200 books and then just have them sitting on a bookshelf and don't actually read them. So, you know, and then playing variants. Some people think like blitz or bug house or bullet or crazy house or three check or whatever is bad for you. I mean, it's, it's not particularly good or bad for you. If it's fun, you can do it. It may teach you a few new things. It may also, um, give you a couple bad habits. Not a big deal. You can do it if you love it. Now, here are some don'ts. Do not do these things. Do not look at computer analysis of your games. Don't look at your accuracy. Don't look at your cent upon loss. Don't look at your number of blunders. Don't look at like what line the computer thinks you should have played on move seven or 15 or whatever. You won't understand it. It's, it's, it's a waste of time. It's putting like junk in your brain that you can't process. It's distracting you. It's also just teaching you to turn off your own brain. Even if you can't figure out what went wrong in your own games, you're better off thinking about it on your own than having a computer tell you some variation you don't understand. It's going to do nothing for you. You're a long, long, long way away from using computers if you're under 1,200. I mean, even if you were 1,800 an experienced player, I would tell you absolutely don't do it. Um, so, so do not. Do not. If you start using computers and thinking that you know the evaluations of positions because a computer told you so or something like that, you're just creating like illusions for yourself about what you do or don't know or understand. You're teaching yourself to turn off your own brain. Really, really stay away from this. This is like, this is like, you know, the don't do drugs commercial for kids. All right. Another big don't, these are all, these are all, <laughs> these are all like don't do drugs, dare to keep kids off drugs or whatever kind of PSAs. Every single one of these announcements on this page. Don't play moves that are not yours. So what I mean by this is when you push the pawn in front of your queen two squares on the first move, don't do it just because, you know, it's called the queen's gambit or something like that, which it's not, but you think it is, right? Um, or because somebody else did it or because you think that, you know, Boris Spassky once did it or something like that. Play moves that are yours. In other words, play moves that you have a reason for them. You know why you're playing the move. You're playing your queen pawn forward because it increases your control of the center or it releases the bishop on c1 that was blocked in by that pawn. You, you have to have some reason on your own for every one of the moves that you make. That way, if your move doesn't work out, your ideas are in play. You're, you're invested in things. Your ideas are being tested and you can get feedback on them and find out this move that I played for this reason didn't work out for some other reason or did work out for this reason, etc. You need to always be playing moves that are yours so that the feedback you get is always feedback for you. If you play a move that somebody else's, you don't know why you do it, you're just rehashing it, and then it doesn't work out, you haven't learned anything because you don't even know what the reason of the move was, so you don't know why it didn't work. So, ixnay on that. 
Um, trying to memorize opening moves, that gets right back to playing moves that are not yours. If you're playing moves that you've memorized without understanding them, that's playing moves that aren't yours. If you're trying to understand them and memorize them, that's better, but it's still a waste of effort at your level to be memorizing things. You should, if you really understand the moves, you can, um, you know, you can figure them out again. You don't, you don't need to memorize them. You can reproduce them if you actually understand them. So don't bother trying to memorize them. Memorization will come naturally to a certain extent, just with like playing and analysis and repetition along the way. And eventually, you know, at some very higher levels, people do make an effort to memorize opening moves um, in order to improve their results. But that's a whole different game than what you're playing right now. Other thing is don't take what others say as truths. Everything that I've told you today, that's what I think is the best. And you can take that as like a hypothesis that you've gotten from me. And then you can you know, test it over time and see if you believe it. Same with anything you pick up in any book, any video. You know, If somebody tells you it's very important to castle quickly in the game, that may or may not be true. It's a piece of advice. You can try it and see if you think that it works or not. Did they tell you why it was good to castle quickly? Hopefully they did. If they didn't give you any explanation, forget it. Don't 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 take something with no explanation, right? If somebody told you on the first move you should always push a pawn in front of your rook and you said why and they're like just do it, just don't do it. Don't do it until you have a reason why. And if they don't have a reason why, they're probably a very s suspicious chess teacher and you probably should be, you know, not even carrying on what they told you as hypothesis. Just leave that stuff behind and look for somebody else to give you advice. All right, don't buy opening courses, don't buy opening books, don't buy opening videos, no. Waste of money, I already told you not to memorize opening moves. Those things are full of opening moves, which you don't wanna memorize. Um, they're generally garbage work as well. The people who do them usually just, you know, hacking away, trying to make some money, which I don't blame somebody who needs to make a living for doing, but uh, you can, you can safely pass it up. Um, it, it, is, it is a waste and they are generally terrible. Um, all right, don't prepare and prepare while putting off tournament play. A lot of people wait to play in a tournament because they wanna be really good the first time they play in a tournament. They wanna to have a certain result or a certain level. They wanna perform a certain way. And then they're studying, they're like, oh, I'm not quite there. And then they study more and then they practice more and they study more and they keep putting it off. Chess players get into a lot of psychological pits. Um, there's so many, so many traps because so many people get their egos involved heavily in their chess play and their chess progress. Um, and that's one of the things that chess teachers are honestly for is like they serve as, you know, specialized chess therapists for you. But um, here's one trap that I can tell you right off the bat to avoid. Don't postpone playing chess. Don't postpone playing in tournaments. Don't like play 5,000 games against like a chess.com bot before playing against a human because you're afraid of playing against humans. Um, it's fine. Go out there, lose a game. You'll notice that the world doesn't end. Your opponent will say something useful to you and suddenly you'll be like, thank God I didn't play a bot. You know, why did I just spend three months playing bots instead of people? None of those bots ever told me anything as useful as this guy. So don't over prepare. Don't put off doing the things that you should do at all. And this segues nicely into the last one, which is don't trip on yourself. All right. Chess players are a very are a very much varied community, all kinds of different people. But we do have a pretty high proportion of egomaniacs, at least among like newer and younger chess players. And as people get older, a lot of them, you know, hang up their egos eventually and uh, stop tripping on themselves. But most people at the beginning are really into themselves. They wanna be the best. They wanna prove they're the best. They wanna beat everybody else. They wanna be world champion. They want everyone to think that they're smart and great. Nobody else is really thinking about you at home. Um, like, oh, I saw that guy play in that tournament and he lost the game really silly. You know, or like, oh, so-and-so is so strong. What a great guy. I think he's amazing. He's so cool. You know, people aren't thinking about you that much. Um, so don't worry about, don't worry about that. Don't worry what other people think. Don't worry about trying to be the best just enjoy the game and you know make some progress along the way enjoy the learning progress and hopefully learn some things that you can apply to other aspects of your life as well okay so along this line you know a lot of people like tilt when they lose they get really upset about losing you know they're so like upset that they lost the game and their opponent won 
But think of it this way. I mean, your opponent was a person too, right? They also, you know, study chess and love chess and played a game of chess with you. They were also sitting there playing a game of chess and they wanted to win. Like, do you think it would have been better if you had won and they had lost? I mean, what what right do you have to win more than they have a right to win, right? Why, why should you just be like the greatest and they should just be what? The nobody, the person who like goes home and says, oh, that guy's so good, that guy's so amazing. Is that the role that other people have in this world? Just to be your, just to be your fans or your victims or those who applaud you, those who worship you. Everybody else is a person too. You know, there's no particular reason why your chess story needs to be the hero story. And everybody else's story is just like, you know, the props on your way through. So it doesn't actually matter that much if you win or lose your games. When you play a game, you try to win. And the winning or losing provides us feedback on whether we're doing things well or badly, which allows us to improve and become smarter. Great. The game does have winning and losing, and you should try to win and lose. But when it's over, get over it and get over yourself. All right. And if you don't, you're going to get in the way of your own learning. So there's a double meaning here on tripping on yourself. A lot of people get tripped up on their own ego stuff, and it actually keeps them from enjoying chess, keeps them from uh, improving because when you're not enjoying it, then you start, you know, not playing as well or withdrawing or giving up or being upset or thinking about other things during your game instead of just the position in front of you keeps you out of flow. So don't do that to yourself. Um, as long as you're feeling good and happy and chill, um, everything will be good and happy and chill. So I hope this is useful to you. If you've got any questions, drop them in the comments section uh, or come find me live on Twitch someday and we can chat about stuff. But otherwise, I think I've given you sufficient advice for you to get up to uh, 1,200 or so on your own from here. And, uh, you know, come ask me more questions when you've made it up to 1,200. I wish you all the best. Great fun, great games, and some artistry. Whatever it is that you love about chess, I wish that you are able to enjoy it and be successful with it. All right, take care everybody. That's it for me.